Um, this is about data integration and annotation. Um, I got basically a cloud of things I could talk about or should talk about. And uh, I hope I'm, I'm in the right zone of that cloud for you. Um, so now, um, do you see my slides? This should now be the second yes. slide, how to get your data shape. Think Beyond the Limits is the non-pretentious title <laughs> of our institute. Um, there are really some really smart people there. Um, um, I, I don't talk about myself, but the other ones are surely very smart. Um, uh, lots of theory. Um, I'm the most practical guy in a, in a theoretical institute, but, but um, as Vladimir Vapnik says, um, there's nothing more applied than a good theory. So um, all of the people who are theoreticians in the lab um, have some, have some uh, application domain in, in which they seek for application of their theory. Um, so, yeah, while you were discussing, I made a confession. I think uh, publishing data is hard for me. Um, it never feels to be the right moment. It's never clean enough. Um, it's always in movement. You think you can do something better or there will be the next data set and so on. Um, and, the ambig and the incentives are ambiguous. So, so and I think uh, all these things get much easier once you get older. Um, so uh, they should be pretty easy for me because I'm on a permanent position. You are not, um, but but um, it's still difficult. So so don't feel bad if it's still difficult for you. Um, so yeah, most of the things have been said. So we are we are um, familiar, I would say, institute. So we have 130 130 people floating around. Um, we, we are, oh, there were some signs moving. So, so for the things we do, we have a relatively good gender balance. Um, we do interdisciplinary research. The common theme is that it's computational. Um, and yeah, and we were funded by Klaus Schira. So Klaus Schira, um, was a theoretical physicist who turned founder of SAP, and then later after his work for SAP, came back to, to creating a foundation that uh, helps scientists or helps also the, the look of science in, in, the, in society. So um, the Klaus Schier Foundation funds the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies, but it also funds buildings like the Advanced Training Center of the EMBL Institute. Um, it founds uh, Explore Science, where where um, people go, where scientists go in a park and explain science to children. Um, there is Forscherstation. Forscherstation is is uh, science for kindergarten, right? So so it it really goes the whole range from from kindergarten kid to to um, research institute and finally to the Heidelberg Laureate Forum which is sort of the equivalent to the Lindau Nobel Forum, but for computer scientists who won one of the big prizes for computer science, like the Turing Award. So yeah, I'm an information retrieval guy. Um, I also have a CV here. So um, yes, I did listen to phone bubbles bursting in an aquarium with a, uh, with a sound blaster card at the time, hacking the hardware and spending the nights because the sound damping was not really good and taking notes when a motorbike was crossing before, in front of the building. So, so uh, kidding my measurements. Um, then I did computer science studies. Um, yes, three three months of software development. Um, yeah. Um, so since two thousand eight, I'm doing what I'm doing. So um, so it all came together. So the the CV was sort of back and forth, but in the end, now I've got a job where it's good that I have some science experience and some computer science experience. So also something, um, things can pan out really well um, without really thinking about it. Um, so yeah, information retrieval and complex data and the complex data is what I came for. 
and I thought I would be doing information retrieval on data and then um, yeah it turns out that it's much more demanding or at yeah, yeah it sucked me down the rabbit hole uh, to to get the data from people how how do we enable to people to give us their data where where are the challenges so um so in the group in the scientific databases and visualization group i'm able to pronounce it right now um is we we do project data management for for projects ranging from the lysim project which is a really big liver project to to uh, smaller projects uh, we are part of things like nfdi and denby um, we do training and things like that um, and often we help people to prepare their excels so um, this is what i'm more or less going to talk about so so and this is the cloud i talked about in the beginning so data structuring labeling how and when can term terminology services be employed how to structure and notate data verification of data um, useful techniques in excel vba python google refine right field many of the things i really touch but vba and python in the end they completely fell down um I just wanted to tell you, so there is Visual Basic for applications. And um, in many ways, it's an ugly language and so on. So computer science purists will tell you it's really bad. Um, but it's easy to learn. And if you do things in Excel, it might be something for you. But the weak point I found out, found out doing things for people in VBA is when you want to send your Excel with Visual Basic for applications attached, it typically gets filtered by the by the mail virus filter. So um, that sort of makes it unattractive. It's rather rather something for you yourself. And Python, I mean, if you look at Jupyter later, Python, I think, is a great language. There are great libraries around. Um, yeah, if if you want to do something really complex, um, look first if there's a good library in Python. And, and then um, probably it will be relatively few lines which you will have to do in order to do your own stuff. Um, if you have questions, I'm open for questions by mail. So, fair. You probably have heard, yeah, in the last days, I couldn't be there um, as sort of my, yeah, I'm the only healthy guy in the family right now. Um, so I spent Tuesday at the doctors and things like that. Um, yesterday, I made the slides. Um, so things are a bit chaotic. Um, you surely have heard FAT, so it's findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. It's 15 rules. And the most frequent rule is, or the most frequent word of this information retrieval people like to count words, the most frequent word is metadata. Um, so so it's good if you want to have your, your data to be fair, it's, it's good to have metadata. So metadata is data about data, or in a way, data for data description. And the goal is to make sense of data for future use. So, and a short overview, really, really short. What are the ways to make sense of data? I think there are three, but first I want to ask you, what is this? It's a keyboard, right? Okay. And where's the S key? I think most of you know where the S key is on this, even though there's nothing on it. So the whole context, the whole location of the key, I mean, if I would simply put you a, a black square and you 
uh, and you look on the black square and I ask you which letter is it, you cannot say anything, right? But by the context, you can say that that this one is the S key. Um, so thinking about this, there are roughly three ways of conveying sense. You can convey sense or some more description about the data by location with respect to other data. You can convey sense by a language and you can convey sense by an ontology. So, oh, I start with ontology. Um, so an ontology is a formal way of showing the properties of a subject area and how they are related by defining a set of concepts and categories that represent that subject. So how is this done? Typically, most of the time when people talk about ontologies, they talk about something like RDF. Um, in RDF, everything is a triple. Um, there is a subject, a predicate, and an object. So you have three points. The predicate links the two endpoints. And there's OWL, which is the ontology web language. Uh, RDF is the resource description framework, um, which in turn can be expressed as RDF and contains triples that are about the relation of concepts to each other. So saying like a mammal is a subclass of an animal, or if A is a child of B, this means that B is a father or a parent of A or things like that. So saying one relation is the inverse of the other. So why do we need something like that? Um, yeah, I should have hidden the right part of the slide. So if you look at cat, if you look at cat written like this, um, many people think about caterpillar. Um, but there's also, if you want, want to stay in biology, there are two radically different way of seeing cat. One is that there's a protein cat. Um, where well, I don't know the acronym, by the way. And there is something called Felis catus, which is the, the animal many people have at home. So if you want to make the difference, I mean, context may help you. But if you want to be sure, 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 you can annotate the word cat to an ontology saying that cat is a child of Felide. Um, or seeing that there's a cat protein in humans, for example. And then I can link that to the word cat and I'm sure which one it is. Or I can put, for example, in the in my sheet in which I have the thing cat, the identifier of this ontology. Like this, I am sure. If you so I cannot go over all ontologies, of course. Um, one nice way to find ontologies is to go to bioportal at bioontology.org. Um, you can search by terms and then see which fits best, best your needs and in which ontology this is. And by this, you can find a subject domain and an ontology which fits what you need and then annotate the data you have to the ontology. sense by location. Um, you've seen things like that, predefined templates. Um, what is this? Um, oh yeah, that's mage tab, what I picked. Um, so there the sense is without annotation, the sense is given 
by the format, by the do documentation, and by the location in the table. So you know that the, that the cell B5 is, is the strain or line design, right? Um, and that this expresses the experimental design. So that what's standing here is the experimental design of the experiment that's described here in the sheet. So the location gives the information. And quite similar, you can convey the sense by language. Um, this is A, B, C, D. And now don't ask me what A, B, C, D stands for. Uh, can you tell me, Juliane? Painful, right? Yes, so... <laughs> something for biological collection data. data. Yeah, but I I have and I the A what we don't A. Ums... <laughs> 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 No, I'm I'm very sorry. Um, okay, so so please forgive me, but. So this is an, an example of ABCD. So if you want to, to find the sense of this, um, first it's human readable, but if there's any doubts to the meaning, you, there's some documentation and the documentation links entities in this, in this XML text uh, to, to, the, uh, to their meaning. So, but um, yeah, now next step is if we want to use these techniques to structure data, how do we go about it? Um, I found the first talk really good. Um, in some ways, pessimistic. I must say that, yeah, quite often, you read somewhere, nothing has been done on the topic ABC. And you find out that nothing is just 100 papers um, or something like that, right? Uh, so so the, the things that uh, you have been hoping for, they, they are already covered. The lower hanging fruit have been harvested. Um, yes and no. I mean, maybe... I'm now, let's say, 20 something years in business. I would say uh, every five years I sit somewhere in a meeting and I go like, oh, this is new. I wouldn't have thought so, right? Um, so, but in general, um, if you need to structure your data, the first thing you should do is to go to fair sharing, fairsharing.org and look at what standards are there for your experimental data and and then see what's not covered um but um so so this can give you uh, yeah a, a look on how to structure your data uh oh um this escaped my my quality control. This is what happens when you write too many slides too fast. Um, so so I, I want to give you um, so um, okay, so we will have in, in the following, we will have some some course on open refine. So that's a tool for transforming data. So it's it's in this framework of locating data in the sheet. Um, and you want to transform your data. And a restaurant is sort of the same thing in simple, or not quite the same thing, but much simpler. And because of this, in some contexts, useful. Um, and, and the other thing is right field, uh, which makes steps towards using ontologies with Excel sheets. How to structure your data. So imagine there's something um, not there that you would need. 
the first approach, and I think it's smart in the end, is to look at what are the existing structures I have. So, I mean, you must think if you have something, something gets out of a machine, you get it as a table. First step is you cut and paste the table. Then I would, in your place, I would minimize the number of manual operations. So, um, more or less directly take the output of the machine and then do the next steps. So if you if you create your own data format, go go via things like that, or take the output of a software you have to use in your workflow. Um, so that you want to minimize the error possibilities, and it's a it's a um, outcome of human computer interaction is you want to look at the system, right? Um, in the 70s, the idea was the computer is right, the person is wrong. And now more modern is saying, um, we have humans, humans make mistakes. And now we try to optimize the system consisting of the computer and the person. And the same thing, look at your data and try to optimize how do I function? I mean, if you if you are good at pasting this in a certain way, then optimize it for that way. The data should fit you in the very beginning and the rest one can do later. So, um, and it's also about finding a routine that you can keep up. So don't neglect the human factors and live with what you have and what you have is yourself and um and know yourself so um try to avoid making your data format to be a new year's resolution you you um the data should be like the stuff you do in october um so this, the second approach, if you want to have something cleaner for some reason, then the way of software engineering, then the thing becomes sort of a software engineering enterprise. And um, the, the modern way to do it is to linguistically express what you want to do and what objects are involved. And um, then you see your data as a collection of objects that have attributes. And then you do some entity relationship modeling or some object oriented modeling, if you want to use the uh, look the terms up. And in our immunoblot example up there, we would say that a blot has many lanes and a lanes have many lines. And a line corresponds to a sample, and then you have to see what does a sample consist of, how do I need to describe a sample, and so on. And with this, you have an, an object model of things that relate to each other, and this you can put into a table. There's lots of experience and feeling involved. Um, I wouldn't expect this to be right in the first time. And I think it's nothing you can do in two hours. So um, this is all you will get on this topic. You will rather get more about, about how to modify data. Um, so fairsharing.org, I already said it. So uh, there are literally thousands of standards around. So finding the standard becomes an exercise. And, um, but very likely you find something to build on. And I think uh, there, there is a help desk in, in NFDI for biodiversity. So if you have concrete questions, if you say, I have this experiment I, and I would like to help there, then I think it's a good thing to contact the help desk and, and yeah, seek for help. 
um, and try to avoid this one, which I think everybody shows in standard related talks because it's so nice. Um, there is always the temptation to find the better standard and so on, but it also gives you standard proliferation. So storyboard again. So why am I here? I want to tell you a little bit about my own Excel journey um, or about the Excel journey as a whole. Um, this is a slide um, from a talk where I had promised someone there would be big numbers. Um, so 37, 37 years, Excel is 37 years old. So it's older than roughly everyone in this group except me. Um, and even older than that is something called Lotus 1, 2, 3. Have you ever heard about Lotus? Okay. And have you, so not about Lotus 1, 2, 3. Um, it was, yeah, the thing before Excel. And um, and I only recently learned that one, two, three meant calculation, visualization, and database functionality. So all computer scientists, you may ask, complain about all these stupid biologists and other people who use Excel for their data, and that's so bad. But actually, um, almost 40 years ago, people advertised that you could use ex um, spreadsheets as databases, so we shouldn't complain, right? Um, and and I think it's it's attractive to use Excel as a database, and we we should live with it. So for years and years and years, um, I was also part of the people who try to make people avoid Excel. But in the end, I realized many things Excel does really nicely because it has been optimized for such a long time. So um, it gives you freedom and flexibility, but that's at the same time, it's a problem because the more freedom you have, the, the, the more, uh, the harder it gets for the software that uses it um, to, to, to use that freedom and flexibility. Um, and now we can use software to help in modifying the Excel and, and to constrain. Um, in 2013, we did something for for a group where we where we tried to build to use their Excel workflow and wrote some glue software that made it easier to adhere to common to lab common standards in uh, in using this workflow so that everyone would do the same. Um, that was nice, but it was not flexible enough. So. Um, this is to say um, I'm, yeah, interested in Excel for quite some time. Um, then there's right field, which you will see later. So it's about assigning ontology terms to, to uh, spreadsheets. Um, then there's open refine, which you also see later. Um, so, but if one looks at it, um, that was also actually one of the surprises in using Exemplify. Um, that, that people agree in, on formats maybe, but the common format becomes an exchange format and not a working format. They typically do something different at home. And then they bring their data in shape if, if they want to exchange. So, and all this adaptation takes time, is error prone, and is often done only on demand. So, and these working formats, they are used by few people and only a few times. And then the temptation is that you do all this transformation, this shuffling cells around that you do it by hand. Um, which is a bad idea, actually, because um, you have a sheet, you modify, and then you have a resulting sheet, but you don't have the changes tracked. So if there's doubt about a data point, in the end, you have to look at the original sheet and see uh, where does it come from. 
and you have to to look really look for it in the sheet because there was some shuffling around or the other temptation is to you write classical software um so the bad it's again a bad idea because you have a huge cost cost but relatively little benefit so you don't want to spend 10 work days for software handling 50 sheets because if you so if you rent a service provider who writes your software it's typically 1000 euros a day full cost uh, 10 work days gives you 10000 um for 50 sheets, so that's 200 euro per sheet. If you would like to spend them differently. Um, so the essence is we want to live with it. People won't always work in standard formats, but they work with what they can use. And instead of optimizing adherence is we optimize for easy and traceable transformation. So, and now I, I thought a bit about what should be the properties of software that transforms sheets. So the typical software I find is a lot like, like this Model T factory series. It's optimized for large numbers. So you, you for writing, a tested piece of software, you have big setup costs um, and, and the time goes into many things that don't have to do with your transformation task, like testing, for example. Um, but we would like to have rather like a 3D printer. Um, you can, in, in two hours or so, you can print a tool in a 3D printer by designing it and then printing it out. That's great. So you have a higher unit cost because maybe the same thing would being extruded in one piece would take a minute or so, but making the tooling would take much longer. But with a 3D paint printer, you can do it at once. And it's fitting for a small number of items. And this is what we want to do. So, Think about this in the following. Um, I think there are some cases where you have, um, which we have to watch out for. The one off case, which is there are Alice and Bob. And Alice says, Bob, please prepare me your data in a certain way. Um, so what we would like to is transform the stuff and then also have a trace about what was the transformation so that we can see for later reference what, what is the data quality. Um, small series is the same, but maybe you want to apply the transformation a couple of times. And we will see that OpenRefine can do that. Um, so again, um, Alice and Bob do a similar measurement. They have different machines, so they have different formats used every day. Alice and Bob want to exchange data for use by Thea, the theoretician, and they agree on an exchange format. Um, this is the typical case I'm confronted with, with quite often, and I think you are also confronted with this sometimes, right? Right, I see mm -hmm. doubtful noddings. Let's see. Um, so, um, yeah, so this is the program for the next 40 minutes. Um, I've got an insane amount of slides, but it's rather like, um, I try to do it in a way that you can accompany me live. Um, so if you wish, if you have OpenRefine installed, then you can start it now um, and get the data file where I put the link there. And this should be if I didn't do a stupid mistake when uploading yesterday. Um, this 
should be the file we use, which has a couple of typical inconsistencies in it. So I go on. So uh, historically, OpenRefine was called Google Refine till some years ago. And before that, it was free based grid works. Um, so it is a web app, but it's made for being run on a single machine. So, so it is not a server which you would share. It doesn't have user management, anything like that. Um, its goal is cleaning messy data. As a small anecdote, we wrote a paper about Exemplify. And um, OpenRefine was a uh, was related work. And we wrote um, Google Refine as a tool for cleaning messy data. And our scientific partner said, our data are not messy. <laughs> Please change. <laughs> but <laughs> so, yeah, we said, yeah, but from a computer scientist's point of view, but I think it's not in the paper anymore. But they have as an advertisement, they, their goal is cleaning messy data. The idea is to have a spreadsheet like interface and, and to enable data transforms. So you, you take the download link, you can get files from this computer or from a web address. So you can get it directly from a web address. If it doesn't work, please download and, and use this computer. But I think it should work if you paste it like that. But it shouldn't be the landing page, but really the download link. So this needs the slash download uh, version equals one. Then you click on the next button. And then you get something like this. So this is a preview where you can see if things uh, look uh, look correct. Um, for for CSV files, for example, you can can check that the column boundaries have been detected correctly and things like that. You can also see if there are several um, title lines. You can say um, I I want to ignore the first ones and so on. So first goodie, there's a bulk search and replace. So we see uh, there's plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, minus, minus. So everything is hypothetical because I don't want to divulge other people's results. Um, there are some, some uh, chemical compounds. Um, there's yes, yes, no, no. There's ya yeah, nine, uh, there are grams, there are micrograms, there are seconds. Oh, this is a mistake. Um, there are remarks, which I then don't use in the end, I think. Anyway. Jana says, uh, how did you get the project loaded? The project is empty. Okay, may maybe I don't like things like that so much, but maybe we just go and and I do it live. So I now have chosen from a huge list of files, which you maybe saw, maybe didn't. Um, I, I chose this file that you maybe downloaded from Fathom Hub, or I could alternatively put the URL here, but I, I right now I don't want to go in the cut, cutting and pasting business. So I go next. Then it looks like this at my place. So then you go create. Then it creates the pro project and then we are here. Um, now am I here? I can go to you, you see my mouse pointer, right? Do you see the pop-up? Yes. Um, so now I can edit here and I can say, okay, I like the plus, so I go cancel, but I don't like the yes because I like the plus better. 
And now I can go and say, apply to all identical cells. Um, same thing is I can put a minus here. And of course the yeah. And of course the nine. Oops, what's happening here? Oh yeah, um, I, I should do some change for things to change. Okay. Um, the magic of what OpenRefine does is that you have an undo redo list, list which is infinite and you can go up. So you can go step by step and see what happened. If you don't like something you did to to your uh, to, to your data, then you can still change. Um, then there are operations. Um, transformation operations and there are, for example, um, common transforms. Um, maybe I go back to the slides because then you can um, yeah, I think I go back to the slides. It's I can go faster over it, but but at, but now you you got your start. So we had the bulk search and replace. We can split multi-valued cells. For example, the mass. And I can do nifty things like by transitions from numbers to letters, which is quite cool because it gets rid of the unit. So split multivalue. So I go on this little arrow here, then I split multivalued cells. Then I transition from numbers to letters. And then it looks like this, which is kind of cool, but not quite what we want, right? Um, because we have every second line with nothing in it except of the unit. And for this, we have a things that's called transposition. So it goes over the whole thing and transposes. Um, so I transpose cells in rows. And then I say, I want to go two by two. And now I've got this. So I've separated the number from the unit. Then there's something called like facets and I said this is a numeric facet and then I get disappointed I get disappointed because searching for outliers um, I'm getting told there's no numeric value in this in this column so I have to turn it into a number and now I see uh, most of the values are here on the left but there's one who is there on the right. Just imagining it would be more than just seven values. But but I mean, it's, it's useful. I think you can get that. Um, so now I pick the outlier and I see, oh, here it's different. And I can fix that. I can change that to nine gram. Oh, mm -hmm. milligram. So it would be, yeah. And this, <laughs> this is, this is really nice, right? So in an example, I make it mistake by a factor of one thousand, which tells you on how careful you have to be with manual changes. Okay. So now, now I fix things, and um, so so then you see the facet, and you can you see how you can can look for values of a different size. 
one of the things um, to to encourage questions is it's hard to get constructive negative feedback. So in, in many cases, people go off and say, it's not for me rather than asking a question. And I'm, I'm over time right now, right? So there's something called reconciliation. And this is when you go to reconcile. So there you use an ontology for, for additional data or, and for improving the data quality. So imagine there would be a spelling mistake or something like that. And you can do relatively easily in, in OpenRefine, you can do reconciliation with wiki data. Um, so, so you go to column and then you go to reconcile, start reconciling. Then there is, at least for my installation, there's not much choice. You choose uh, Wikidata as a reconciliation service. And then you say that you want to reconcile each cell to an entity of one of these types. And you say you want to a chem chemical entity class and auto match candidates with high confidence. And then you press start reconciling. And then you get something like this. And I'm quite interested how long it will take because for me, it already took some while when I'm alone. And now 20 people doing this to Wikidata may be a bit painful. So we will see if it works. If, if it doesn't, I, I will simply show the slides on how it looks when it works. So it looks a little bit like this. Um, there is. So for me, it looked rather like the five below. What you see here is that I was nosy and did a couple of clicks and then was not able to turn it back. Um, so you you see that that D glucose has a problem. Water has been matched to water. Nicotine has been watched, uh, matched to nicotine and ethanol has been matched to ethanol. If I'm not content with that, I can see what are the other suggestions and look at them. And this is what you see here. If I press a little hook, a little check mark here, I choose to reconcile with that check mark. Um, and if I take the double one, it, it goes for all other occurrences of nicotine that it gets reconciled with nicotine. And for D-glucose, there was nothing. So I go like, I want to search in the reconciliation service for a good match. So um, I see that there's one for the D-glucose isomers, or I, can, or I can pick one. So I take D-glucose, and that's it. And then I'm done. Now, once I've reconciled this, I can add columns from reconciled values and say I would like to have the mass. Wikidata has the mass for the molecules. So this is edit column, add columns from reconciled values, take the mass, then you get a preview. And um, I don't know the other ones, but water seems to be approximately correct. And then you go on OK, and then you have a new column. And you can do something with it. So that's pretty magic. Um, so finally, um, so, so this is just a short start. I think there are many things to play with uh, in, in Google Refine. And I hope I whetted your appetite. And um, so there's in finite undo redo, and there's export, import, export, and reuse. 
So if you look at this, and this was human readable, I can go back and forth. You have seen, seen this already. But also there is something which is called Grell. Um, there is an expression language which um, puts this in JavaScript, in, in JSON. So you basically can take a both human and machine readable representation of this and cut and paste it. And you can go the other way around. You can take uh, something that you cut it and paste it and possibly modify it and can apply this to a sheet which you have in OpenRefine and then store this. So as always, when things get interesting, I leave it as an exercise to, to play with this. And now I'm awfully over time with respect to what I thought I would be. Um, but I hope it, it's really helpful. Um, restaurant. Um, it's a pretty simple idea, which is pre pretty useful, I think. Um, so just imagine we have this data, which we want to transform in that data. And we would like to keep a trace of this. And we will, and ideally, we would like to keep the trace of this in the same Excel workbook. So um, this is Bob's sheet in Excel. Yeah, now I take a little bit of software, which does nothing really complex. Um, if you want to see the data file, that's the output of this. You go to fathomhub.org, same, same thing as we had, but this time, time file 6271. Oops. So it basically, now we have two sheets. And uh, the second sheet looks the same on the on the face of it, but it has this for every sheet, simply a formula, not for every sheet, for every cell, it has a formula. What does the formula do? The formula looks as this. So it's a non-constant formula. It depends on other cells. This is the first equals. We want the value of cell A1. And we want to value want the value of cell A1 in sheet one. And the address A1 should not change when moving the cell in question. So and if a cell is empty, it shouldn't con be converted to zero, but to empty. So basically this formula now is in every sheet, every cell of this sheet, referencing the original. And now the nice thing is if I go about and do cutting and pasting, then it will follow me around. So for example, I do a transpose, cut and paste. And um, I'm already close to the common format. Then I do some visual formatting and move things down. So now I can see I have cell C3 here, which has the value it should have from Bob's sheet. But I can also look at that it comes from cell B3 from Bob's sheet. So I have done a modification of my sheet but by this simple trick of using references before modification, 
I still have a view on what was the original value and where it came from. And there's actually um, uh, functionality in Excel which enables you to uh, to visualize this and to look it up. So if you have more complex formulas, you can look up in Excel which are the cells that have been involved in building this value. So um, via this simple trick, you can record what you did. And the nice thing is, so, so this is the one-off use case I talked about. Now we can take a second sheet, a second sheet in Bob's format, and we make a copy of this sheet. And this copy still points to the original Bob sheet. But if I do a simple search and replace for sheet two instead of sheet one, it points to the corresponding sheet in Bob's new sheet. So by copying one Excel sheet, I have, um, by copying one Excel sheet, I have, um, and doing one search and replace, I have applied the same transformation to another sheet. So this solves the small series use case. So in five minutes without much possibility to make errors, I can apply the same transformation to a new sheet. So from there, lots of things to go. So what we did so far is we have one piece of software which creates this copy sheet um, and which isolates one of one transformation sheet for further use and something that applies a sheet. But as you, as you have seen, applying a sheet is pretty simple. It's unfortunate that we don't have the time to really try this out. Um, but yeah, it's still unpublished. Um, if there, so so um, we are we are handing in uh, the paper for a work workshop uh, at the end of this week or at the end of next week. Um, and then there should be the the GitHub repository should be open by then. Um, we we will send that around if you want to play around with that. The advantage, so there are lots of drawbacks with respect to open refine, but the advantage is that you have the whole representation of you of what you did to the sheet is within the workbook. So if you if you give your workbook to somebody else, the somebody else will have the original data and will have the transformed data. And I think that's pretty useful. There are other advantages. I mean, it's really lightweight. Uh, people don't need to install anything to view your stuff. So, so it's nice, but it's, yeah, in a way it's very little software. I think this, the, the three tools con combined is 100 lines, but, um, but it's rather the way of thinking of how to use your Excel that matters in this context. So we tested this, it works in about every um, spreadsheet software we know of. So there's future work, but I spare you that. So finally, right field, I'm supposed to do right field in four minutes. Um, so I, I would like to credit Stuart Owen from Manchester and the Carol Goebel group, who, who is the heart and soul of, of Wrightfield. Um, so again, a data file, which is an old file, which has been done via Wrightfield. If you, so 
I saw this yesterday. So it's being fixed that there's a license. I, I think it's for other people's use. So um, use it. Um, so this is the result of what you get when you use right field. Um, it is a sheet, and in this sheet, you can you can uh, you have several fields which are which have yellow in the back, and these fields um, enable you to make a selection. So, seen from the other side. <clears throat> If you start right field, you are given the choice if to load something or open a spreadsheet. Um, when you choose load, you have to give the OK that you that you want to use an ontology. Um, and then things look like this. So pretty much the same as in Excel with the exception that you see here the ontology terms. And if I now go on the field design type, you can see it corresponds to the experiment design type and says the selection list should be populated from the instances of the experiment design type. And then you can, if the list gets too long and you can constrain it you can even reduce uh, how which terms to use so this is if you hover over the design type this is the overall list that would be given as a drop down list and if i restrain it to these two the drop down list looks like this um I had to do with the screenshotting tool. It didn't get around wrong. This is why the font size varies. I think for you, it will be always the, the font size, the same font size. You can export this as RDF. You have to give some identifier for the URLs. So, so RDF uses um, URLs as terms. So it's a little bit like Java, where you go like uh, the name of your organization, your name, and then you do things on top of that in order to make things unique without with respect to other organizations. So um, I now simply chose their hits and onto and right field. So I'm pretty sure it won't collide with anything at hits. And this is what the RDF looks like, which I chose. So currently the RDF that gets out of right field annotated sheet is a star. Um, so you have triplets. They all are descriptions of the document. Um, so what's on our to-do list for quite some while is to enable more complex graphs. So currently we are not able to, to express things like the unit of this field is a meter or something like that. But we can say meter arises here not very interesting, but um, we can say what we mostly use it for is saying in this sheet, there are certain experimental uh, methods arising. Um, now within NFDI for biodiversity, we will go on and extend it so that on top of this big use of the selection lists, um, we will get a more rich RDF which then can be used for more complex queries than there are now. So summarizing, it's a great tool for adding selection lists from ontologies. You can pick subtrees from an ontology. So 
yeah, play with it and see what you can do. You can pick out uh, items out of the subtree and you can assign these to fields or regions. The whole RDF information, no one is going to see in it. It's on hidden sheets. And yeah, the future work will be more complex RDF. So yeah, the hiddenness is one strong point. And yeah, that was it now. Um, I hope you liked the mix. It certainly um, was fun for me to prepare. <laughs>